Tonight we're going to talk about why does lung disease have Ireland fighting for breath. And to put this in context, one in seven Irish people have an undiagnosed lung disease and one in five Irish people will die from lung disease. We have recently opened an Irish Centre for Rare Lung Diseases in Beaumont Hospital. And we see this, these diseases as prevent, presenting us with great opportunities but also great challenges. And I'll briefly go over them over the next 20 minutes or so. They're important in their own right because although they're rare, they can be very, very debilitating for the patients who have them. But they also tell us about more common conditions. So we learn a lot about common garden emphysema from our studies in hereditary emphysema, and we learn a lot about bronchiectasis from our studies in cystic fibrosis. Over the next number of years, you'll see more and more personalised medicine. And it's the rare lung diseases that will lead the way in personalised medicine. We'll develop therapeutics which will be more focused and unfortunately more expensive. And there will be a dynamic between the pharmaceutical companies, government agencies, and us as patient advocates and our patients themselves. So this is a famous curve that we shoot all our medical students. It's called the Fletcher Peter, Fletcher Peter curve. And here we have lung function, and here we have age. And the important part of this curve is it shows that as you get older, your lung function falls. But some people's lung function falls more rapidly than others even if they smoke, particularly if they smoke. And within the smoking population, some are what we call rapid decliners and some are slow decliners. And for many years, one of the big questions for us is, can we distinguish who's a rapid decliner and who's a slow decliner? And about 50 years ago, by accident, this was discovered. In Malmo in Sweden, Laurel and Ericsson were doing what we call immunoelectrophoresis. And they noticed that three patients were missing a band here and they went back to those three patients and found that three out of the five patients had severe lung disease. And this was a clue that lung disease could be caused by something other than purely smoking. So these people were lacking a protein. And they found that this protein was what we call a serine protease inhibitor called alpha-1 antitrypsin, which we call alpha-1 from now on. So alpha-1 is a serine protease inhibitor. And they found that people who are lacking in this protein were much more susceptible to cigarette smoking induced emphysema than others. So one of the questions we had in this country was how common is this problem? And we we're very fortunate because in Ireland we have access to a DNA collection in Trinity College, a DNA database, and it's a random database. It's collected according to electoral register, a mouth swab is taken, DNA is, is extracted, and all we know is the age, gender, educational status and county of birth for those individuals, and it's anonymized, but we have the DNA. And what we found was that there are two common variants of this alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and we found that they're extremely common in Ireland, much more common than we would have thought. So the two common variants are the S and the Z or Z alone. So we did a study on this, and we found that in Ireland, the estimated prevalence of severe deficiency was two th over 2,000 people in the Republic alone. Intermediate deficiency, around 10,000. And in this group here, mild deficiency, 170,000. So in the whole of Ireland, north and south, we have 3,000 individuals with a very severe deficiency. So that means one in 25 Irish people carry the gene for hereditary emphysema. So they're more susceptible to cigarette smoke than other populations. There are an estimated 12,000 who are SZs. That means they've got an abnormal gene from both parents, they're intermediate deficiency, and have an increased risk if they smoke. And then there's over 250 MZs. And this is a really big population. And this partly explains why certain people have more severe lung disease for the same amount of smoking compared to their colleagues. And what we found with this group was that if you look at MZs who don't smoke, they have no increased risk. But an MZ who smokes has a five-fold increased risk of getting COPD, chronic obstructive lung disease, as a similar MM or normal individual. With regards to ZZ individuals, this group are a different kettle of fish altogether because we know there are a lot of ZZs in Ireland also. So some years ago we went to the, the government and we said we should do a targeted detection program for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And we said we'd be willing to do the test on everyone with suspected COPD, everyone with poorly responsive asthma, every 
a first degree relative of a person with alpha 1, and then people with liver disease of unknown origin because it can cause liver disease as well. And we identified over 300 people with disease E mutation out of a possible 3,000, which is quite a big number actually. And we found over 2,400 MZs in a targeted detection program. So we've tested over 16,000 people to date. The test is free, and we've got quite considerably large numbers. Now, of these 2,300, we identified definitively that if you smoke and you're an MZ, you have a significantly increased risk compared to the normal population. But the real kicker is this group here, the ZZ individuals, because we found that if you're a ZZ individual, even if you don't smoke, you have a problem with your lung function. You can get emphysema even if you don't smoke. So this is a real wake-up call for us all, because up until now we felt if you didn't smoke, you couldn't have emphysema. And now we realise that people with severe deficiency of alpha-1 can get emphysema even if they don't smoke. If they do smoke, they get emphysema in their 40s, severe aggressive emphysema. And to put this in context, of the first 100 lung transplants in Ireland, 10 or 10 per cent were alpha-1s, ZZ individuals. So how do you treat this? So obviously non-smoking is a very important part of it, but non-smoking alone will not cure this condition. So working with others, we developed a specific treatment for ZZ emphysema. And what we did was, we purified alpha-1 from the bloods of MM individuals, we treated it to kill any bacteria or viruses, and we infused it once a week to people, into people with the ZZ form. And we found we could get high levels of alpha-1 into their bloodstream above a protective threshold. And then we did a thing called a bronchoscopy, where we put a camera into the lung and sampled the lining of the lung to see if you can get this alpha-1 from the bloodstream into the lung. And we found we get high levels of alpha-1 into the lung of people with alpha-1 antidescription deficiency. And not only could it get into the lung, but it could also protect the lung by inhibiting enzymes that can cause damage in the lung. So, we had now evolved towards a treatment, a specific treatment for emphysema in people with a severe deficiency, whereby we give an infusion of alpha-1, purified from plasma, once a week, indefinitely. Now, for years, we were wondered, did this work clinically? Because biochemically, it should work. We'd replaced the protein that was missing, and we'd got it into the lung. And over the next number of years, we showed that this could decrease decline in lung function. Now, you'll hear a lot over the next hour or so about lung function. We tend to measure responses to treatment in various ways. And one of the big ways is by measuring FEV1, the amount of air you can blow out in one second. And this is a hallmark of obstructive lung disease. And we found that in people receiving intravenous alpha-1, they had a decreased drop in their FEV1 over a period of time. And then we also found, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve, which is really survival data. These are people who have received intravenous alpha-1 antitrypsin, and then a group that didn't. And we had this increased survival in those receiving intravenous augmentation therapy for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So you might think this is good data, which would help us get this medication paid for throughout the world. And the answer is it's not. This uh, medication was approved in the US in 1987, and they've been taking it over the last 30 years with good effect. In Ireland and in other European countries, the reimbursing authorities demanded more evidence. And they demanded a randomised controlled, placebo-controlled trial. And these are very difficult to do because to show a change in this lung function parameter, FEV1, you'd have to study 550 patients over three to five years. And it's almost impossible to do that. So we looked at other ways to monitor the effects of this intravenous alpha-1 antitrypsin. And we hit on the following way. So you'll see a lot of people who go in to get lungs tested and they'll get a CT scan of their chest, a CAT scan of the chest. And the CAT scan is very useful. It'll show any tumours or whatever that's there. But also, it gives us an opportunity to measure the lung density, how dense the lung is. People with emphysema lose lung tissue and the lungs become less dense. And we can measure that quite specifically over time in people with emphysema. So we set up a study whereby we give intravenous plasma purified alpha-1 to people with severe deficiency of, of alpha-1 and emphysema, and we followed them up using CT scans over a period of time. And this is the data here. This is placebo. This, that means these people received 
nothing other than a diluent, and these people here received intravenous alpha-1. And this is decline in lung density, and you can see there's a very significant difference between the two groups. So the people receiving intravenous alpha-1 lost one-third less lung density than those receiving placebo. And then at the end of two years, everyone was switched to receiving intravenous alpha-1, and the slope of this curve changed dramatically, and again they lost much less lung density. So this is the first time we've ever shown, specifically and indisputably, that intravenous alpha-1 antitrypsin slows down progression of emphysema in people with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And then we looked at it slightly differently. As you know, the lung can be divided up into different parts, and apical segments, central segments, and basilar segments. And we know that alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency mainly affects the lower lobes. And so with that in mind, we looked again at lung density over a two-year period, Significant decreased lung density loss in those receiving alpha-1 antitrypsin. But when we look at different parts of the lung, this area here, the lower segments of the lung, specifically, were much more protected than others. Because in this area, you lost less than half compared to people receiving placebo. So this is really a, a landmark study. It's just been recently published in The Lancet and Lancet Respiratory Medicine. And it means that we can actually slow down progression of emphysema in people with this deficiency. Will it work with people who have the deficiency? We don't know yet. But this is an area that we're really working on because we have quite a number of people who would benefit from this therapy. So when these studies were done, our patients were continued on the therapy until reimbursement was sought. We're still re seeking reimbursement and we're hoping to get it because it's an expensive therapy, but it has a tremendous effect on our patient population. So that is one of the classic genetic diseases that we, we, we can discuss tonight. The other big genetic disease in this country is cystic fibrosis. Now, cystic fibrosis is a very common disease in Ireland. And to put it in context, um, one in 19 Irish people carry a CF gene. So that is really common. And if you look at this here, up until 1938, it wasn't even regarded as a specific entity. There's a general belief that some children did poorly that they got a lot of infections and they didn't do that well and died prematurely. But around the 1940s, we started to realise that this was an autosomal recessive disorder, and that means you had to get the bad gene from both parents to have the condition. And then in the 1950s, we developed a test for this. And the test is quite interesting. In the 1950s, in New York City, a lot of patients, a lot of babies or young people were being brought in, collapsed. And a fellow called De Sant'Agnese recognised these patients had this syndrome, this cystic fibrosis syndrome, and that they were losing lots of salt in their sweat. And he realised that people with CF lose more salt in their sweat than other individuals, and that was the basis for the diagnostic test for cystic fibrosis. In the 1980s, cystic fibrosis was still a paediatric condition, and that's all changed. It's changed dramatically, so that in this country and in most European countries at the moment, Almost all our children live, live into adulthood. Our population is about 50-50 adult and children. So these are tremendous, tremendous uh, improvements. Not because of major uh, scientific breakthroughs, really, but simple things. Multidisciplinary teams, good nutrition, specialist centres, specialist antibiotics. But the reality of it is that in Ireland today, the median survival for cystic fibrosis is about 38 years and it's still not good enough. We'd like it to be much better than that. So how do you cure cystic fibrosis? We've mentioned, we mentioned earlier on about a possible cure for alpha-1. How do you cure CF? And to cure CF, you must look at what causes CF. So again, it's a genetic disorder, mutations of the CF gene. And that causes problems with ion channels. These are salts going back and forth across uh, epithelial barriers. And in the CF lung, you get production of abnormal mucus. And that's the hallmark of cystic fibrosis, coughing up lots of abnormal, thick, infected mucus. And you get lots of bacteria, and the bacteria you get in CF is different than what general people get. The bacteria in CF is classically pseudomonas, or other types of bacteria. And these bacteria are very difficult to eradicate. So this causes enormous amounts of inflammation, destruction of airway structures, and eventually, our patients with CF will die from lung disease mainly. So 90% of the mor mortality in CF comes from lung disease. It does cause other problems as well. It causes 
gastrointestinal manifestations, diabetes, uh, bone disease, but the major cause of death is lung disease. So why not go for the cure? And so in the early 90s, I was involved with a group that decided we would try for gen genetic therapy for CF. And it seemed to be a good idea because you could treat all CF with this genetic therapy. And we focused on using a virus called an adenovirus. And we got adenoviruses and we made them replication deficient by cutting out certain parts of the viruses and putting them in the CF gene. And we knew that the adenovirus loves airway epithelium. And we knew we could make it replication deficient. And we could make it that it was very avid for lung epithelium. And with that as background, we did our bronchoscopy, our camera test again, and we brushed the airway epithelial cells from people with CF. And this is their airway epithelial cells here. And then in the tissue culture, we infected them with an adenovirus containing the CF gene. And this red stuff here is normal CF protein. So we knew we could do it. And then we proceeded to administer the adenovirus, firstly in the nose, and then 24 hours later in the lungs people with cystic fibrosis. And the initial studies were very, very encouraging. We found that we were getting these red cells in the lung. We found that we were getting the proper messenger RNA in the lung. And that these cells were actually working. We are now putting out the proper concentrations of salts across the epithelial barriers. And then this happened. So these are CT scans and chest x-ray. This is a classic chest x-ray. We'll go through it slowly. So you can see here, this is a person with CF, and this here is bronchiectasis. The airways are thick, they're inflamed, and they're clogged with mucus, all up here. So we had administered the adenovirus into this area here, and this happened, marked inflammation. So when this happened to our patient, we were terrified because we had made what we thought was a replication deficient adenovirus. And our fear was, it has now become replication deficient, it combined with factors in the airway epithelium and it was now a mutant virus that was replication efficient. And we treated the patient with normal antibiotics, etc., etc., and we found that this adenovirus itself was causing the problem. That if you introduce adenovirus to airway inflammatory cells, it causes production of a cytokine which causes lots of problems in the body and in the lung. So eventually this cleared up in this patient but basically, that was the end of adenoviral gene therapy and cystic fibrosis. And three years later, adenoviral gene therapy was used for another condition. The patient, unfortunately, died, and that was the end of adenoviral gene therapy. So the gene therapy was now out. So we went back to the drawing board, and we went back to the basic problem in cystic fibrosis. And as I said before, the basic problem in CF is thick, inspissated mucus. And so if you have a test tube, and you get some CF mucus, into that test tube and turn it upside down, the mucus st sticks to the, the bottom of the test tube. It doesn't move. Now, most of that stickiness is due to DNA, high molecular weight DNA. So we, along with others, experimented on producing a recombinant form, a genetically engineered form of DNAs, an enzyme that would cleave DNA and make it more liquid. So we did that in the test tube, and we proceeded to do our first study in recombinant DNAs in patients with cystic fibrosis. And again, we went back to lung function. <coughs> FEV1, and the amount of very good blowout in one second, the amount of very good blowout overall, in a small number of patients, but we saw dramatic improvements in lung function. Dramatic improvements up by 10%, 20%, 10%. This was fantastic. It was so good, in fact, that the patients who were involved in the study started to buy shares in the company that was making this stuff. <laughs> And in fact, they bought shares in Genentech. And to put it in context, when Genentech got their license to make this drug, they applied to South San Francisco Airport to close down for half an hour so they could have their fireworks display. It was such a blockbuster drug. And then they went on a bit further and they did it in over 968 patients. And again, significant improvements in lung function. But the problem with this was, and something you may have noticed, that the improvements in lung function in the bigger numbers were not as striking as those which you saw in our initial control study. And this is a recurrent theme in cystic fibrosis, indeed all lung diseases, that the measures by which we measure efficacy are somewhat crude. So the next thing we looked at was nebulized antibiotics in cystic fibrosis. So you're all familiar with taking antibiotics by, by tablet form or intravenous form. 
we were interested in aerosolizing antibiotics directly into the lung in CF. And we did this with a thing called tobramycin. And the initial studies with tobramycin weren't that good. And we found out that, in fact, the tobramycin we were using contained within itself a material which caused bronchoconstriction, caused the airways to close down. So we proceeded then to give aerosolized tobramycin, and again we saw enormously improved lung function in these patients. So that was two things we could do for people with CF. Gene therapy wasn't working, but we could aerosolize recombinant DNAs, we could aerosolize antibiotics, and that could improve lung function. But lung function isn't the only game in town, and this is something that bothered us at the time. Now, one of the reasons why we are so fixated on lung function was a study from this fellow, Kirem, in Tel Aviv, and it was a good study. And what he said was, once your lung function falls below 30% predicted, you have a less than 50% two-year survival. So in other words, once your lung function fell below 30%, and we're talking about the FEV1, the amount of area blow out in one second, you had less than 50% two-year survival. And that's why we all got fixated on lung function. But FEV1 alone was not enough. And this is a study from other people. And they suggest that many people survive beyond two years with an FEV1 less than 30%. And in fact, the range is between two and 14 years. And it wasn't so much the number itself, but the rate of decline was important. And, and Mike Constant uh, also demonstrated this as well. So again, we went back to the drawing board. And in Bowman Hospital, we had quite a large CF population, over 160 patients. And we decided to say, see if there was a better way of predicting who is going to do badly and who is not going to do badly in cystic fibrosis. And we defined badly as needing a lung transplant or dying. And we looked at a number of parameters. And the ones we found that were most important were, again, FEV1 was important. But it wasn't an FEV1 of 30%. It was once your FEV1 fell below 52%. So this is, we would have thought that was quite good in the past, but now we realised that was a bad sign, an FEV1 less than 52%. Exacerbations, number of infections in the last three months was important. And your weight, your BMI, your body mass index, if that was low, that's another bad sign. And if all these things were happening before the age of 24, that was a bad sign. And we weighted all these, and we derived a score called the ABLE score, we published this, and the ABLE score basically showed that if your ABLE score was greater than five, you had a 40% chance of being dead or requiring a transplant within the next four years. And this changed our thinking about how to measure efficacy of drugs. Not all FEV1. It's more than that. And then something very interesting happened. So one of the things that... Uh, we, with the, in the rare lung diseases group, have realised is you need registries. You need registries for cystic fibrosis, you need registries for alpha-1. Our registry in alpha-1 helped us show that MZs who smoke have an increased risk. Our registry in CF showed us something else, really important. So you can see, this, is the, this blue area here, these are people with a certain CF mutation called a Delta F508 mutation. And this group here, these are people with a G551D and a Delta F508 mutation. That means they've got a G551D mutation from one parent and a Delta F508 mutation from the other parent. And that has become, that's really important. So we have about 10% of our population, in fact, Bowman, 14% of our population had a G551D mutation. Worldwide, that's 2 to 3%. So, a company called Vertex in the US was doing a lot of studies. And they'd said, forget about gene therapy. And what they did was, they started getting cells from people with the G551D mutation or the Delta F508 mutation and growing them in the test tube and then trying various compounds to see if they could correct the CF defect in those cells. And they found a specific compound that would correct the defect in the G551D mutation cells. And the reason why it was easier in that mutation was, in the G551D mutation, the abnormal protein, the CF protein, gets to the apex of the cell, it just doesn't work that well. It needs to be switched on. In the Delta F508 mutation, the protein stays around here in the endoplasmic reticulum and doesn't even reach the apex of the cell. So the G551D mutation, the protein gets up to the apex of the cell, doesn't work that well. So you need to switch it on. And so that's what they did with this drug called Kaleidico. And we were very fortunate to be involved in the early studies in Kaleidico. And the first thing to notice is this area here. If, I mention, if you remember, we mentioned that the way to diagnose CF is with a sweat test. And the sweat test 
And the person with CF is usually up around here, 100 or so. And within weeks of starting Kaleidico, it normalized. We have never, ever seen that before. So an enormous fall in sweat chlorine. And the next thing we found that within a week of starting the drug, the lung function had shot up by about 10%. Their quality of life score improved dramatically. And their BMI, their weight, again, dramatic improvement. This one here is interesting, decreased exacerbations. So it hit all the various parameters of the ABLE score. Improved lung function, decreased exacerbations, improved BMI, all within a very short period of time. This was a blockbuster drug. An interesting thing was, it was sent to uh, our NCPE in Ireland and the, the cost was absolutely sky high. 234,804 euros per patient per annum. And they balked at that. And then they said it would, started to negotiate with the, with the pharmaceutical company to reduce the price, and our patients were given access to this drug. So we have approximately 150 patients with the G551D mutation in Ireland, and I can say they've all benefited dramatically from the drug. What about the Delta F508 mutation? If you remember, we have far more Delta F508 mutation people than G551Ds. The Delta F508 is about 60-70% of our population. And the problem with the Delta F508 mutation, the protein is stuck in the endoplasmic reticulum. It doesn't reach the apex of the cell. So it's not just a simple matter of turning it on. You have to move it up there first. So you need what we call a corrector and a potentiator. And that's what our CAMBI is. You've probably all heard about our CAMBI. It's a corrector and a potentiator. And the data from lung function wasn't as dramatic as we saw with Kaleidico. Lung function went up by 2 to 3%. But the real change was in exacerbations. It de decreased infective exacerbations by 30 to 40%. A significant decrease in these infections. And that means that's like gold dust to people with CF. So people who are in every two months in hospital getting intravenous antibiotics are now in every four months or every six months. So to them, it was a major, major deal. But that's the problem with rare lung disease. It's the problem with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. It's the problem with cystic fibrosis. And the problem is the drugs do work. But do they work well enough for the price? And different methodologies are used to assess that, but all the flaws. And does it mean healthcare rationing? So to put this in a bit of context, why are drugs so expensive? So let's look at this one here. In general, you have to test 5,000 to 10,000 compounds to get one potential new medicine to move into preclinical studies. Vertex screened 228,000 and 164,000 unique substances to find Kaleidico and or can be respectively. So this is an enormous amount of work, but it's effective. Alpha-1 antitrypsin, when we use for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, it's a plasma purified pro product. And people are always concerned about transmissibility of bacteria, viruses, or prions. So it has to be specially treated to kill all those. So it's not just a question of purifying it and leaving it at that. More than 70% of all investigational medicines fail to make it past preclinical studies. They never make it into a patient. Because they're tested in animal models, etc., etc. And one in 10 investigational medicines that make it to phase one clinical trials, only one in 10 receive approval by the FDA or EMA. And in fact, 85 to 90 percent of all new approved drugs provide few or no clinical advantage over existing therapies. But we have in the rare lung disease area two specific drugs, or three specific drugs. We have Kaleidico, which is a blockbuster drug, or Cambi, which is quite a good drug, and alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is also quite a good drug. So is that the end of the story? And this is a really salutary lesson for us all. Over the last two years or so, people in the area of hepatitis C have been working to develop new drugs. And they developed a combination of drugs for hepatitis C virus. And they give these drugs to a number of patients once daily for 12 weeks. And the results were absolutely astounding. They actually wiped out all the hepatitis C. They cured the patients with a drug given for 12 weeks. And you might think that would be great for the company. That company would be set for life. And I was talking to one of my colleagues recently, he said, the company's shares have plummeted because they've cured the disease. So it's not as simple as we would think. You know, it's important to cure disease, obviously we think it is, 
But sometimes with these companies, curing the disease may actually put them on the back foot, so to speak. So for some conditions, the new medications work or seem to work. Are they good enough to warrant the price? If we believe that, we need better ways of estimating efficacy. We need more patient group involvement. We need innovative strategies such as risk sharing. So if a drug doesn't work, we stop it. Or we, we, we may ask the company to reduce their price or whatever. And finally, we have to stop therapies if they don't work. And that's the difficult part. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.